Hello, and welcome to the Know It Some podcast. No one likes to know it all, but it's always good to know it some, and I think we could all learn from different experiences, different people who have uh, perspectives that are not the same as our own. And today for our pilot episode, I have for us an interview with Force Crawford, who is a medevac pilot. That's right, a pilot interview in our pilot episode. He flies medevac helicopters. He flies folks from the scenes of accidents to hospitals, transports people between hospitals, and also deploys to some natural disasters throughout the United States. Forrest Crawford is also a Marine Corps veteran. In fact, we served together both in training at Naval Air Station Pensacola, as well as Cherry Point, North Carolina, the Marine Corps Air Station there. And we also crossed paths, uh, overlapped a little bit in Afghanistan in the Helmand province. Um, he's an incredible individual, has a lot to share with us, and with no further ado, no advertisements whatsoever, um, which goes along with the fact that I do not have a recording studio or professional sound equipment, so bear with me. But no sponsors, no advertisements. We're going to get right into the meat of things and start our interview. So this is pilot episode one, Forrest Crawford. Enjoy, guys. I've already kind of let the listeners know a little bit about yourself in, in the intro here. Um, but what, one thing that, you know, is common throughout the military is you get stationed places, you know, you don't just learn uh, somebody's name that's working alongside you. You kind of learn a little bit about where they're from, you know, uh, whether, you know, it's Steve from Miami or, you know, Jonathan from Minnesota. And uh, when, when I first met you, it was in Pensacola. And I'll never forget how you introduced yourself and, and where you were from. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're from, Forrest? Uh, so I am from a small town in Crawfordsville, Indiana. Um, you know, it's just a small town USA, commonly referred to as a flyover state. Um, you know, most people would never, never hear of a, of a town, small town in Crawfordsville. So, um, you know, we grew up small town, about 15,000 people or so, and uh, family owned uh, grocery stores growing up. So um throughout my childhood and stuff i worked in our uh, family grocery stores and um yeah what what sort of departments did you work in 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 the grocery store just kind of stock or i mean you do deli with my family owning it and stuff i've pretty much worked everywhere especially at the older i got um you know through high school and stuff i was actually worked as a um uh, a manager a store manager um so i would fill in every department whether it be the um deli or the you know cash register you know i did all type of management stuff produce you've done it all um, produce the only one I, I never really did um was the meat department mainly because uh <laughs> evidently they have issues with people under the age of 18 running um saws that cut through bones and stuff got so. you got you but you can work a slicer at the deli counter yeah it's fine they just not 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 cutting through you know giant giant pieces of meat yeah yeah exactly exactly so um i would do that i would do um you know uh uh balancing of you know the checks and all kinds of stuff so i would i would i got a lot of experience um young before you know becoming an adult as far as running a business goes um that's but. awesome and and so from from there you know you're in high school you're working at your your family's grocery store and then you decide to uh, join the military and, and of all branches, you know, cause you could get benefits from any branch, right. But of all branches, you decided to join the United States Marine Corps. And h- how did you come upon that decision? What, what brought you to the Marine Corps? Um, so, you know, it really sounds cliche and all, but, um, you know, growing up, uh, nine 11 was a big event, you know, in our childhood. Um, you know, now, now, you know, mm-hmm. kids today, you know, they didn't really experience that, you know, they, they read about it in their history books and stuff, but we're getting to that, that period where, you know, people joining the military now haven't had a, you know, a large, you know, planned attack like that on the country. Um, so, right. you know, nine uh, eleven was a big role in my decision to join the military from a young age. So growing up, um, you know, I always knew that I was going to join the military, um, so, so what brought you to that branch? So when, you know, when that time came, um, honestly, you know, I had, you know, my sister was a couple years older than me. Um, she was actually in the process of joining the Marine Corps. And, you know, um, so I looked up to her. That was one of the reasons. Um, also, I was um, like many 
um, kids a little stubborn and wanted to be, if I was going to join the military, I was going to join the toughest branch. And obviously that's the Marine Corps. Um, I wanted the obviously, hardest. Yeah. And, um, and that's why <laughs> I was stubborn in the fact that um, I would join the Marine Corps. I'll never forget. So my, you know, I, I come from a family that has, you know, you know, several generations in the military, um, whether it be the army, the air force or the Navy. Um, and I was, you know, give you a little backstory. I was named after my, my grandfather. And so of course, growing up, I was, you know, I walked on water to him. Um, so he awesome. uh, was in the Navy during world war two. And I'll never forget the day I told him that, you know, I was joining the Marine Corps and uh, he kind of looked at me. He's like, why would you do that? They're a bunch of mean guys. <laughs> yeah. uh. Um, you know, there's that old joke that says, you know, uh, the Marine Corps is a department of the Navy. It's the men's department. Um, yeah. And, and my, my my dad and my grandfather were both Navy. So I, I, I can definitely see where you're coming from there when it comes to uh, to having family that's in the Navy and, and telling them that you're going to join yeah, and, uh, and, the Marine Corps. And of course, from that point on, you know, we would go back and forth with jokes about each other. And, you know, some of them, you know, while mild, like, you know the men's department some of them were a little bit more crude and maybe not appropriate so (laughs) well we we won't uh tell those here i guess um but but then so you joined the marine corps right but then you and i ended up having the same um job in the marine corps the same mos um uh, military occupational specialty for those of you civilian listeners um and and that's how i met you uh you know you and i were stationed together in pensacola we were stationed together and, and, and actually roommates for a short period of time um, over in North Carolina. And then we went our separate ways for, for a few years in the Marine Corps. And then in, in what I believe was both of our last years in, um, we crossed paths for a couple months. We overlapped in, in Afghanistan at, at, um, in the Helmand province. Yep. And, um, and so we were both aviation ordnance guys, right? So, so why don't you, I mean, you probably could do a better job of it than, than I can. Why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about um, RMOS and, and some of the deployments that you went on during your, um, time in the Marine Corps. Oh, I don't know if I could, uh, could tell it better <laughs> than you, just like you remember, you know, going through our, our schools and stuff together, we were, uh, both competing with each other, both trying to get top of the class. So, and we both were uh, absolutely good competition for each other. I feel like, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, um, aviation ordinance, um, um, to break it down, you know, we built, uh, did any type of armament that was on, uh, an aircraft, um, whether it be Mm -hmm. a, um, uh, a cruiser gun, a, um, a rocket or a bomb or, you know, uh, any of that missile launchers, yeah, launcher. The whole, yeah. The all the way deal. from the, the, the actual rack, the launcher, um, all the way to actually putting together the ordinance itself. Um, yep. which is a little bit different from some of the other, other services, um, because so the Marine Corps, you know, um, with our with their usually, typically lower budget, we actually assembled all of our ordnance when as of, you know, the Army actually received all theirs um, an all up round, con- which means it was already assembled. So a big difference right. would be from the Marine Corps to like the Army or something with that would be that we actually assembled all of our 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 bombs and stuff. Done. Yeah, there's something special about that too. I think is is being over in um, a combat zone, and you know, uh, putting warheads onto rocket motors and torquing them down and loading them into the launcher and delivering them to the flying squadrons. I mean, you you're, you're really seeing that process uh, almost from the ground up. Oh yeah, um, that, that's definitely special. Uh, but but particularly, you know, you and I were both on. So so in aviation orders, you could be on either. Uh, the fixed wing uh, side working with, uh, you know, uh, jets and, and stuff. And then you can be on what, what they call rotor wing, right? Working with helicopters. And, and you and I were on the helicopter side. Um, and, and I'm imagining that might have played a role into what you did when you got out of the Marine Corps. Um, so, so, you know, could you tell us a little bit about what you do now uh, for a living and and uh and kind of how you wound up uh there tell us a little bit about that journey because i know it was probably a bit of a journey uh yeah of course so um obviously like you said you know we both worked on the rotorcraft side of um, aviation ordnance for the most part um and so you know whether it was um it, but you know both deployments i was i was working i i did you know um one deployment on a mu and then one deployment in afghanistan i was working you know pretty close with um the 
helicopters. And I, you know, I, there was a couple times, several times that I actually got to fly in a helicopter. And so obviously I made that decision at that point that I was tired of, you know, supporting the helicopters and I wanted to be the one flying it. So, um, that's awesome. And it, you know, it had, you know, it stemmed. It, I, I never actually, before joining the military, I never realized that I was, uh, I wanted to become a pilot. So going into the military, you know, I had no ambition of being a helicopter pilot um, per se, besides, you know, your childhood, you know, dreams of firefighter, police officer, different stuff. Um, but right. there was, you know, from a childhood, there was a couple of times that, you know, I flew in a helicopter and yeah, I thought it was really cool. But then once I got in the military and I was working, um, near helicopters a lot. I was like, you know what, that's something, something I could do. Um, and I was actually, um, you know, I, I told people, you know, we sit, sit around and talk a lot in the military and I, you know, I told people that's something that I was interested in doing when I got out. And, um, so actually it was three years into my enlistment that a couple of my friends who were, um, getting out then and was going through steps and taps, you know, a class, um, that is required to get out of the Marine Corps in order to, um, you know, open up and show you your different types of benefits and you know, schooling, entrepreneurship and all that stuff. Um, right. Being a veteran 101 really is what yeah, it was. Yeah, exactly. You know, try, try to, you know, you know, make decisions on your own type thing um, out of the military. Yep. So um, they, they were there a year before me and there was a school there um, that was, you know, advertising and, and handing out pamphlets about becoming a helicopter pilot. So of course they knew that I had talked about that before. And so they, you know, came back eagerly and handed me a pamphlet that said, Hey, look, you know, you can do this, um, using my post nine 11 GI bill. Um, that's so awesome. that's what I did. I, I, you know, from that point on, I kind of reached out to the school, talked to them well in advance of me getting out. This was actually before my, um, deployment in Afghanistan. So while I was actually in Afghanistan, I was making phone calls and sending emails back to uh, a college in Utah about becoming a pilot. Um, so I was already, you know, setting this stuff up before I got out. Um, and, and so that's what I did. I used my post 9-11 GI Bill um, to go to school, earn my uh, bachelor's degree um, in aeronautics and become a helicopter uh, pilot um, and actually a certified flight instructor. Um, so I earned a, um, a teaching certificate in, in helicopters to be able to teach. And that's, that was, um, you know, my first job was teaching. Um, and I think that's what you, you either were doing or about to, to start doing when I, uh, ran into you in, in St. Louis, uh, uh, a few years back. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and you were, you were an instructor at that time, I believe. Right? Um, you know, I, 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 I remember, you know, you come in into town and stuff. I'm not sure exactly what time period that was either. I was, um, working towards, um, that rating mm -hmm. because there are several ratings and steps that you go through, you know, you start off at the basic level and then you keep moving up. Um, so I, I can't remember if I had just started or I was finishing up, but I was, I was yeah working on becoming an instructor. Right. Now, now, you know, I don't have any sponsors on this podcast. This is the first episode, and uh, you know, there might be three listeners. There might be, uh, you know, eventually uh, quite a bit more if they, if uh, listeners in the future come back and and uh, go through this catalog. Um, but you know, I will uh, plug OtterBox a little bit anyhow, um, and, and say that uh, that it's uh, pretty remarkable. I, uh, now, now, I believe you you dropped it from from how high your your cell phone? Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, one of the uh, the times <laughs> while I was flying, um, one of the uh, interesting stories was that I, um, actually, so, you know, often, especially in the summer, we fly with our doors off, um, the helicopter. So, you know, you can lean out, you got all this airflow and stuff. Either way I was flying, nice. um, and I dropped my cell phone, my iPhone out of the, uh, helicopter. Um, and we were probably right around 2000 feet, <laughs> um, or, or 24. That's a great so feeling, it was about 2000, sure. 2000 foot drop. Um, Oh man. And of course, luckily, you know, iPhone has this handy find my iPhone thing app. So I was able to, we, we circled right. back around, went and landed and I hopped in my car and, and, and drove over, was able to find it. And, um, surprisingly, um, it was sitting inside of an otter box and, uh, it was not damaged at all. I was, I picked it up. There were some scuff marks on the otter box, but the, the phone <laughs> turned right on, was working just fine. That's that's remarkable. The fact that you were even able to use the find my iPhone thing, I would have thought that thing would have smashed into I don't know how many pieces. Yeah, so. and, you know, honestly, um, I was probably pretty close to it because where it fell, 
um, was right off the side of a major highway. So when I actually drove back, I had to drive oh, off the shoulder boy. and then walk down um, the ravine part. Um, so it was it was mm-hmm. within, uh, you know, 100 feet or so of landing in a major intersection. Um, and <laughs> glad, I, you know, I didn't hit a car or anything. Um, That's remarkable. That's remarkable. Now, now, so, you know, once you became a certified, uh, a certified, uh, helicopter pilot and instructor, um, you, you didn't, you then took a, a different turn in your career. Um, if you could tell our listeners a little bit about what you do now and, and how you came about to do that, cause I would imagine with, with, uh, with a pilot's license, you could have probably done a, a number of different things. Um, so, so how did you come to do what you do yeah, now? So, um, actually, um, so right now I work for Arivac Life Team. Um, it's based out here in St. Louis. Um, however, we have bases um, all along the country. We've actually now became um, part of uh, GMR, Global Medical Response, which consists of over 340 bases in almost every single state. Um, and AIRVAC, interestingly enough, was the whole reason, um, one of the reasons that inspired me to become a pilot in the first place. Growing up um, in oh, Indiana, wow. we had a um, uh, uh AE 39, which all of our bases are, you know, AE followed by a number. So um, the 39th base um, was just south of us um, in my hometown. And one of my friend's uncle, um, his brother actually flew for Arivac and still does. We actually uh, work together now. Um, But as a child, he would come. um, They had, you know, a few different like public relations um, uh, events and stuff where they would fly into our school and, you know, show the kids the helicopters and stuff. So that was my first like big experience, um, seeing a medical helicopter. Um, so it's cool that, you know, I, I moved on, I went through flight instruction and I got a job with Arivac. Um, first I worked with them as a maintenance test pilot. So I was going through and I was, you know, testing to make sure after an aircraft had been completed with maintenance, I would go out do all the checks, go fly it, make sure it was flying correctly. Um, before we'd return it to service to a, um, to a base. And now um, I'm actually flying uh, medevac uh, missions with them, um, whether it be, you know, transferring from a hospital to another hospital or, um, you know, landing on the interstate to a car accident or, um, you know, Mm. all different types of stuff. Um, That can be some tough stuff for sure. You know, I going through school in Utah um, is when you when you first start school is when you really start to learn the, um, how broad the helicopter industry is. Um, you know, people don't realize what the amount of work that helicopters do. I had the options of, you know, firefighting, um, different utilities such as, you know, you know, putting up power lines, putting up, um, heavy lift stuff, putting air conditioners on top of buildings. They do, um, setting up big cell phone towers. You know, a lot of those are put up by helicopters, um, and then there's other, other options wow. like the oil industry down in the Gulf, um, flying to oil rigs and stuff, or even private charters and, and, and stuff over in New York and East and out West, um, different big cities, you'll, you'll, you'll charter people. So, um, I never Roger imagined, that. you know, going straight into, um, medevac, um, but I love it. Um, it's, um, it can be born. Um, it's, but it can be extremely, <laughs> A lot of sit yeah, around it's, and wait. It's just, you know, we're set up just like a firehouse where we, we live there. Um, our med crew works 24 hour shifts. We work 12 hour shifts. So we have a day and a night pilot. And uh, so we, okay. yeah, we sit around, we wait for our um, tones, tones to go off and tell us that we have a flight. It... And then we run quickly mm-hmm. out to the helicopter and take off and go do the flight. Uh, so, so is it just in, in terms of flight crew, is it just you or do you have a co-pilot? Um, so there, there are all different types of programs. Uh, the current program that I am in, we have a single pilot. Um, so I'm the only pilot on, t- on the aircraft. Our crew consists of a pilot, a flight paramedic, and a flight nurse. Um, there are programs okay. out there where they are and, dual pilot, but we are not one of them. Roger that. And um, so let me ask you, uh, right now you know, given the, the challenges facing, um, your industry, uh, with the pandemic, how, how has the job changed for you, uh, since COVID-19, um, came to the U S has has there been any change in the way that you handle, um, these medical, uh, evacuations or transfers? Um, how's that change? You know, it really depends what aspect you really want to dig into. There's the, the COVID-19 has affected the industry as a whole dramatically, you know, a year ago, 
um, we were talking about pilot shortages, how um, by 2030, um, businesses, airlines and stuff were going to be closed because we just didn't have pilots anymore. Um, six mm-hmm. months later, um, now we're talking how and we don't have any job openings anymore right now um, because of um, the end of, or COVID-19, they hit the airlines. So airlines were laying off. I mean, I think the airlines have laid off, you know, 14,000 people, um, you know, thousands of pilots have been laid off. So they would, you know, naturally go to helicopters if possible or somewhere else. Just like before this, you know, the airlines were um, actually paying helicopter pilots to switch over and become an airplane pilot and fly in the airlines. Um, and then now no the, the oil industry wow. took a huge hit. Um, so people left the oil industry and so, came to medevac helicopters. So as far as, you know, even with gotcha. that, the pilot shortage and stuff like that, it's, it's altered it a lot. And then when you get into the metal medical aspect of it, um, a year ago, um, you know, it was v- really uncommon for us to have to wear, um, PPE or, you, you know, protective personal equipment, um, on flights. Um, right. typically, you know, you would only have to wear that for like, you know, meningitis and different, you know, airborne stuff that we could, could get. But obviously COVID-19 mm-hmm. is very um, airborne. And so every single flight now we're wearing masks. If we're flying a COVID patient, which we do fly COVID patients um, um, quite often. Wow. Um, I was actually watching mm-hmm. a video. Um, we've transported um, 55,000 COVID patients this year by helicopter. By helicopter. And is that just that, that back, is, or are there um, other that companies? That is all of global medical response. Um, Got you. Mm-hmm. And actually, so the 55,000, <laughs> um, I believe that includes uh, ground ambulances as well, um, because global medical response mm-hmm. consists of ground ambulances as well. So that 55,000 is um, is with uh, ambulances as well. Uh, I correct myself. Yeah. Right. But, but still, probably a, a large number of folks, especially if their conditions worsening maybe the oh, facility yeah. they're in um it, can't cater to them the way that that they would be able to uh be helped by another facility you're doing the transfers exactly probably. And some of these are, are um, you know very critical care um um patients so they're they're coming out of the intensive care unit into another intensive care unit and a lot of ground ambulances aren't um qualified or certified to be able to transport um stuff like that so we have you know we're we're transporting people on ventilators inside the helicopter to another hospital um and so yeah Mm -hmm. now we wear n95 masks we wear gowns we wear face shields and all this stuff which you know makes can make flying a helicopter um difficult while you're adding uh we already you know we wear a helmet while we fly um and now you're putting a face shield over that with a mask um, and all this extra stuff, um, that easily fogs up sometimes or, um, you know, makes it where you can't talk over your mic to, to ATC and different stuff. So there are other challenges plus decontaminating right. the helicopter afterwards, after every single flight with a COVID patient, um, we go through several hours of cleaning the inside of the helicopter to prevent the spread of COVID. Right. Yeah. That's, that's definitely going to, to change the way that your, your day-to-day, um, feels when you're, when you're dealing with something this unique. Um, and then you were also telling me, you know, part of breaking up the monotony is, uh, that you occasionally will deploy, um, uh, for, for different national, national, uh, disasters, uh, uh, across the nation. Uh, for instance, the natural disaster that we had of the hurricanes down in Louisiana. Um, I'm sure you've done some others. Uh, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, some of the, some of the things that you've done that's maybe yeah, outside so one thing the norm. That's- pretty fascinating with our, our company, especially um, now that we are um, this global medical response and we actually respond to national disasters or natural disasters all over the world. Um, so our company, we've, we've done, um, we've deployed to the fires out West. Uh, we've actually, one of our uh, medical helicopters out West has been outfitted with a, um, they call it a Bambi bucket. It's a bucket that holds a large amount of water. <laughs> um Scoop yeah. it up from a river so, or something yeah, and so dump we, it. We right? have one of our medical helicopters out there with you know taking water and throwing it on fires. Um, we have we were deployed Jeez. to New York City um, as an epicenter for COVID. Um, mm-hmm. We were deployed to right. um, New Orleans for the same reason, um, and then also these this 
high hurricane season. We, we, you know, we had a ton of hurricanes hit this year. And so with those came um, flooding and, you know, power loss and all this stuff. So we actually, um, the deployment that I went on, I went for, down for hurricane uh, Laura a um, uh, month and a half or two months mm-hmm. ago. And we, we took 25 aircraft, 15 helicopters and 10, uh, 10 uh, airplanes down there. And um, wow. with over 200 personnel. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a big movement. I mean, that yeah, really is a deployment. Um, so, you know, it was <laughs> oh. a, basically a squadron of people went down there and um, to help evacuate people um, from, you know, whether it be a hospital that was flooded around or a nursing home um, that, you know, just didn't have the, the power anymore and, and the supplies to be able to take care of their patients um, and, and fly them in, in more further mainland to get away from the disaster so they could get treated. Gotcha. Now, now you've been out of the Marine Corps for how long now? Um, six years now. Okay. So in the last six years, cause uh, you know, I'll, I'll speak for uh, on behalf of several friends of mine that are veterans. Um, we, we've kind of found our way, uh, here and there, you know, we, we, uh, start out in one direction, end up having a course correct here, here and there as we, as we figure things out. Um, if you could go back to uh, maybe a year or two before you got out of the Marine Corps um, and, and do this thing over, um, you know, are, are there any things you would have changed? What, what, is there anything you wish you, you maybe had done sooner or done differently in your journey to, to get to where you are right now? Um, you know, it's kind of a difficult question. I feel like I had, um, I had some several advantages um, going for me getting out of the military. Um, I got out of the military as a single, you know, 23-year-old um, ready to, to, you know, hit the ground running. So, um, gotcha. you know, I was able to move out to Utah. I, I packed what I could in my car um, and I just left um, to become a pilot. Nice. Um, you know, part of it that threw me off as far as becoming a pilot was, you know, we left the academic setting. I mean, I know you didn't actually, you, you went through school, you were still going through school and different classes and stuff while you were in the military. But a lot of us, um, you know, didn't go through school while we were in the military to take any classes right. um, besides military required courses. Um, so you, you were taking <laughs> college courses, but some of us, a lot of us were not, we were out, you know, right. Fun. Um, but so that was a, a big change was going from the military. I, I, although I do believe the military helped me give me discipline in order to accomplish my goals faster and easier um, it was still a big change mm-hmm. to go into an academic setting, um, go into a school and, and, and that be your primary job, you know, going from math class to science, to English, and, and, and then also, um, other classes. So, um, the one thing that caught me off guard, especially about becoming a pilot was the amount of academic work that was required. Um, when I drove out <laughs> to Utah, the only thing, I mean, I'm going out there to become a pilot. So the only thing I thought of was, I'm going to hop in a helicopter and I'm going to be flying all the time. Well, that wasn't the case. I mean, I did fly a lot. <laughs> However, there right. were, you know, I had to learn everything from federal regulations to aerodynamics of a helicopter to global weather patterns. Um, to, oh, yeah. Meteorology. To the mechanics sure. of the aircraft. You have to have a really good understanding of how, you know, the engine works, the transmission works. So that way you can help, you know, diagnose problems in flight because you have an understanding of how each component works. Um, all the way to human factors, um, you know, the way the human brain works, all the way to, um, um, you know, having to know about yeah. the, our eyes, how our eyes work, how our ears work, so we know how we can com- combat spatial disorientation and all this stuff. So it was, it was definitely something I didn't realize. So um, It's a complex degree. I mean, it's certainly not – I mean, no, this is not to offend any of our listeners with liberal arts degrees, but it's certainly not – um, you know, some, some sort of uh, degree where you can uh, get in and get out and focus only on one subject area. You have to know quite a bit, I would imagine. Yeah, and that um, was, that, to that become was a definitely pilot. something that I, um, I was not prepared for. Um, and it was difficult. I, you know, trying to study for all this different stuff, I went through different, several different um, um, plans of how I was going to study. I had a whiteboard with a calendar and wrote down days that I was going to study certain things because they're all so different. Um, we actually, I, I lived in a house with two other guys that was in the program with me. Um, mm-hmm. and we went to home Depot and we bought, um, 
whiteboards, four foot by eight foot whiteboards, and we hung them all over our house. Um, we screwed them wow. into the wall, and at, all throughout our house was different things wrote on with whiteboards, whether it be you know aircraft limitations or weather stuff. And so that way, we were always seeing stuff. We'd be sitting there watching a football game, and to, to the right of it would be limitations, and we were just studying all the time. <laughs> um, we looked like a bunch of nerds, but it was difficult. It was a lot of studying, so <laughs> we we did what we had to do. That, that's that's phenomenal. And then when you finally did get to sit behind those controls, I'm sure that was a oh, great definitely. feeling. The first, the, um. I'll, I'll never forget the first day that I I soloed a helicopter by myself with nobody else in there. Um, and you do that as a student, you know, before you even have your license. So it's one of the requirements. Right. And to go in, in, I mean, I mean, you're drenched in sweat, though. You are so nervous. But once you're done with mm-hmm. that, you realize that you just flew a helicopter with no one else's help, no one's else's assistance. It was just you. Now, um, I know that with fixed wing, a lot of times uh, part of the, the instruction is you have to do touch and go landings. Do you guys have to do something similar with uh, helicopters? Oh, yeah. or, I mean, especially um, in a, um, uh, a training environment, we do we use runways just like airplanes do for training. Um, we, we also you know, mm-hmm. do not use runways like they do, but a lot of times <laughs> we will stay in, a, in an airport environment and do touch and goes just like they do um, because that's where you can get most of your practice mm-hmm. in. Um, uh, now also in training, uh, in the, in the Marine Corps, I'm sure you went through this too. I, I know I went through it, um, uh, more times than, than I wanted to actually, uh, it, most people only do this once. Um, the, the dunk tank, um, for, for those of our listeners who have not experienced this, um, which should be the majority of you, um, there's this thing called the dunk tank and basically they take a hollowed out, uh, mock-up of a, of a fuselage, um, it might have flown at one point, might might not have. Um, and uh, this thing uh, is hooked up to machinery that will uh, dunk it in a pool and spin it. And um, they put you in it and they dunk it and spin it and expect you to get out. Um, did you have to experience anything like that um, when you went through school or was that just a military um, thing? So requirement wise, that was just, you know, we did that in the military and in, in preparation for certain deployments and stuff. Um, civilian wise for helicopter training, we didn't have to do anything quite like that. Um, oh, lucky we you. did. I did have the <laughs> opportunity to go to a um, hypoxia chamber um, where they actually um, slowly reduce the oxygen concentration in a room. Um, oh, so wow. that way you can see how your brain changes. Um, and your thought process, you know, completely goes away. Um, so there's different things like that. That also is not a requirement. That was just, you know, something that happened. Um, Additional training. And do, do, have you had situations where um, you were doing a, a medevac and you were uh, unable to land? So you, you might have had to hover anything like that or, or not, um, not yet? You know, and, and, you know, that would be um, so for medevac, you you would never um, do like that, like the like the movies and stuff. Um, that... Got you. I watch too much. Uh, Hollywood. <laughs> now, now, search and rescue. Uh, so... Search and rescue is a different story. You know, there's a lot of regulations when it comes into medevac and search and rescue, and and having your licenses for certain mm-hmm. things. And so, as a regular, you know, medevac, um, you wouldn't do that. Search and rescue. You want to be stable on the ground when you're loading uh, somebody that's not exactly 100%. medically stable. There's right. too many risks. Um, otherwise, there are you know mm-hmm. search and rescue that use hoist and different stuff, um, but that's that's not um, what most medical helicopters do. Um, okay. See, see, the, there there are all these myths and and you know misconceptions regarding um, your job, and like like that's one of them, right? Because we see a lot of things in Hollywood. And I think a lot of people, when they when they think of medevac, they think like that crazy search and rescue kind of a feel. Um, you know, are there any other uh, common myths or misconceptions when you yeah, tell people was, what uh, you do? Um, any yeah, questions that's, that's you get? Great leading into this because that's one of the biggest things I think is ho- so many people watch Hollywood movies and helicopters. You know, it's not like you see a helicopter every single day. Um, so most people's, um, you know. Yeah, first reaction yeah, their first you reactions, you they, they revert back to, you know, a movie they saw. Um, so, um, you know, whether it be a war movie or an action scene, um, nothing is ever as exciting 
as what it is in the movie. I will tell you that. <laughs> um, whether whether it be you know a helicopter <laughs> getting shot down or a mechanical issue, and you know for some reason in the movies right. the helicopters always if if something goes wrong they spin out of control. They're just you know spinning through the air, which that's that's not going to happen. I mean there are some some mechanical issues that could cause an aircraft to spin out of control in flight. Very few, um, very rare that that would ever happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reality, at least in my opinion, helicopters are actually safer than airplanes. Um, and part of the reason I say that is a helicopter can land anywhere. Okay. Um, so, you know, if you're thinking, you know, for instance, an engine failure, um, on an airplane, um, while they can glide a, a, a pretty good distance, um, because for one, they're, they're higher, they have, you know, better aerodynamical surfaces than mm -hmm. we do. Um, so they can glide a good distance, but they still need a pretty open area, um, relatively smooth area. If they don't want to end up, um, flipping the airplane when they land. Um, so it, it, they need a pretty, they have, open... they have less options really. I mean, yeah. And so in a helicopter, while we can't glide nearly as far, um, one interesting thing about a helicopter is that our transmission is um, uh, engineered in a way that if we do have an engine failure, that our main rotor, um, the gears disconnect from our engine. So our engine is no longer the driving force of the rotor system. In fact, it is as we fall down, the rushing air from below us still, you know, makes our rotor system move. So we basically fly to the ground. Now we are limited on our distance of flying right. because we have no engine. Mm -hmm. Um However, we're still, you basically just fly to the ground. Um, yeah. um, there, there are, you know, a little, it's a little bit more complex than just flying to, to the ground with, with an engine. But um, for the most part, you can land um, almost anywhere as long as you, you know, 50 feet by 50 foot area on a street, on a, in a cornfield, somebody's backyard, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're able to land a helicopter way easier. And oh, your, yeah. field, your field of view is a lot larger, you know, in an airplane. Um, uh, that, your, field, your, your field of view isn't nearly as, as big as a, a helicopter. No, not, not at all. I mean, you're, you're essentially in a, in, in a bubble, right? And, but then, you know, there, there come challenges with that, um, you know, uh, maintaining your, your horizon and, and making sure that you're flying level, um, to somebody that is a fixed wing pilot, right? They're going to be a little more disoriented at first, um, than, than you would uh, initially expect because you think, oh, well, they're, they, they fly planes. They can definitely fly a helicopter. And, and that's not necessarily the case at all. Well, um, yeah. And, uh, you know. So the biggest challenge, you know, especially coming as a flight instructor, one of the challenges. So I've always told people it's easier to learn helicopters first and then go to airplanes. Um, mainly because if you learn an airplane first, some of their emergency procedures are 100% opposite of a helicopter. <laughs> so right. when they have an engine failure, for instance, they push forward because they need to get a nose down attitude so they can see where they're going. Right. Um, in a helicopter, the very first thing is you, you want to put your nose up. And part mm. of that is to help the air rushing underneath the rotor system. Because if oh. you don't, then you're, if your rotors get too slow in the air, you can't recover them. They can't speed. They can't magically right. speed back up. Okay. Um, so those are big differences between the two. Um, oh, yeah. And that's your initial, system. right, like your instinctual reaction when you have engine failure. Um, and so that's definitely something that you want to be on point. And if you're, you're training for years and years as a fixed-wing pilot is to do one thing, you know, um, to, to kind of override that, I would imagine, would be difficult. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, regarding myths and, and misconceptions um, with helicopters, you know, I, I tell people that I worked on them and, and flew uh, on them, not flew them, but flew on them. Um, while well, if, in, you, if you ever want to fly one, come, come back up to St. Louis and we'll go for a <laughs> I'll take you up on that someday. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I tell people, you know, I, I flew on them quite a bit and, and I felt um, relatively safe. You know, I, I really um, had no issue with it. And, you know, I think they see all these mishaps that happen with, um, you know, tour, tour, uh, uh, guides and tour, tour companies and, and certain places where the maintenance is just, you know, the maintenance on the helicopter is garbage. Uh, the, the company maybe has a bad reputation has been fine before. Um, and, and it has really nothing to do with, uh, helicopter flight or, or helicopter safety in general. It's just, unfortunately, like with anything you have, sometimes you're bad apples and, and, um, you know, and then there, there are sometimes things that are out of your control, 
Um, but, you know, my, my favorite joke about the whole thing is how, how often do these things crash? And the response is uh, just once. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, one thing I've always been told is that so the the aviation as in the industry is a relatively safe industry. It's just a very Absolutely. unforgiving industry. Yeah. Um, you know, when something yeah. goes wrong or, you know, you make the, a bad decision, um, it's it's hard to be forgiven for that. And and so that's where some of these instances come from. Now, I. I, I, you know, this is kind of coming out of left field and, and feel free not to answer it or, or we can edit it out if, if we need to, because um, you're probably unprepared for this one. Um, but I just thought, you know, a lot of our listeners are, are big time sports fans. Obviously, earlier this year before um, COVID, before the pandemic, uh, I think that the new story that was on every television in America was um, the tragic passing of Kobe Bryant and his daughter, Gigi, and um, the other passengers on that flight. Um you know, I know that that fog and, and weather played a large role in that. Um, as a helicopter pilot, was there anything you were able to glean from that story that maybe the average um, American uh, wouldn't understand about the conditions um, or, or about some of the stuff that might have been facing that helicopter pilot that day? Um, you know, the, uh, any sort of insight that you could give us um, on that? Yeah, uh, obviously you weren't there, but I'm sure you've heard certain things. Yeah, well, well, um like I said, and, and you can edit this out if you want, because I'm, I'm going to be kind of blunt with this. Um, one of the things, that came, I mean, as soon as that happened, obviously me as a pilot, I had several people reach out to me or people, you know, as soon as they find out I'm a pilot, they're like, oh, well, what do you think about Kobe Bryant and his accident? And um, that's just that the average American doesn't, and, and you know, it, helicopters isn't part of their lives. Um, so, while it was tragic, the only reason anyone's talking about it is because it was Kobe Bryant. It was someone famous. It was his daughter and the, his, his family and mm-hmm. friends. Um, unfortunately, accidents um, do happen. However, um, people, their biggest thing to me was, you know, how can you fly that? It's so unsafe. Um, yeah. But yeah. And then I asked him, I go, well, well, you know, how many, can you tell me about some of the other accidents uh, in helicopters that you know about? And nobody, you know, nobody was able to say anything because, you know, you don't typically hear about other helicopter accidents. Certainly rare. You're, you're, yeah. you're, it's way more dangerous to be um, in your vehicle driving down the road than it is a mm-hmm. helicopter. Um, but oh, yeah. for that that specific incident in itself, um, yeah, the, the weather was the, in my opinion, um, you know, I have not read the full um, NTSB report and stuff on it. Um, in my opinion, the weather was the, um, contributing factor to that um yeah and i assume one of the biggest issues um in the helicopter industry especially private charter um is external pressure and we preach it to our students um it's one of our human factors that we talk about in external pressure of you know this flight needs to get done or i need to get to you know from a right. to b right now um, high profile client that says you know this is this is what i'm paying you to do right and, and I, um, I need you to do it and, and it might not even been um you know i don't want to say that you know in my opinion i think kobe bryant was pressuring him to fly it probably wasn't even kobe bryant himself um but the guy that worked for it's subliminal company, and the company mm-hmm. does not want to lose high profile clients like that exactly um and so a lot of times and i have tons of friends that have quit jobs or left jobs or been fired from jobs because they wouldn't do something that was unsafe. Mm -hmm. Um, However, some people are pressured into doing things that are unsafe, like flying in um, poor weather like that. And the the visibility that day was, was terrible. Um, They they say that terrain changing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and they say that, uh, you know, the pilot was forced to hold for a a certain period in that fog um, for air, you know, airport traffic to clear I believe at Burbank, I'm not sure, uh, I might not have the airport right, but um, they they had to, to hold for traffic to clear. And um, I've been told by helicopter pilots that if you have to hold for a certain amount of uh, time with poor visibility, you can, it, you know, can happen to any pilot. Um, you can become somewhat disoriented. Oh, um, definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah, being holding like that in low visibility, um, and that's one of the biggest, you know, contributing factors to two helicopter accidents is poor visibility um, or flying into unforecasted weather. Um, And it's a human reaction. When you get into low visibility, you're going to start looking outside, squinting, trying to focus on a certain area that the visibility is, you know, slightly better. Um, Right. But when you focus on that area and then that area then disappears, 
you, you know, you bring your head back or you look back to, you know, regain your bearings, but there's nothing to reference. You're, you're not, you don't see anything. That's horrible. Mm. Um, and so it's, it's extremely, um, easy to get disoriented or let yourself get to that point. The biggest point, um, to make there for, you know, pilots that are, um, you know, people that are aspiring to be pilots or, or pilots or student pilots or pilots that's never been in bad weather like that is, um, the very first sign of it, you have to go back to your training. Everybody should have procedures, um, to follow when, when they're flying in weather that they're not supposed to be or unforecasted weather. Um, mm. and you should immediately, um, you know, um, put your pride to the side and, and go and follow those procedures. Um, ATC, you know, I, I heard people, um, blame air traffic control on that. Um, but the issue is, is, is air traffic control, um, does not know, um, what that pilot's capabilities are. Um, that, mm. that aircraft, while I'm not sure if was certified to fly in bad weather, um, is capable of flying in bad weather. Um, there's a difference between capable versus actually certified and licensed to fly in that weather. Uh, right. So air traffic control has no idea what he is capable of. Um, okay. So unless he tells them, um, you know, one of the big words is declare an emergency. Um, for for right. my company, if we get into weather like that, we are to immediately declare an emergency with ATC because that, for one tells them that, okay, you're in trouble, you're having problems and they won't put you in a hold like that. Um, right. Because they know that they need to get you to an airport or to better, better weather immediately. Um, so the, the, the ATC had no, um, play in, in his decisions for that. Got you. Yeah. You know, again, like you said, um, it's, it's great advice that you're giving out in terms of sticking to your training and, and what you've been trained to do and not, uh, thinking that, that you're somewhat uh, above that or, or capable of more than, than what's being asked of you. Um, what, what other advice would you give to somebody interested in, in getting into the profession? If somebody's interested in becoming a helicopter pilot or a medevac pilot, and they're listening to this, uh, interview, um, what advice would, would you give somebody that's interested in that career? Um, so I have a couple things. Um, I would definitely, um, anybody who is either a student pilot or wanting to become a pilot, um, it would be, you know, take your studies seriously. Um, especially coming from the military. Um, unfortunately I've seen a lot of people come from the military and go into to become a pilot and they feel almost like they've been, they're entitled to becoming a pilot just because they have the GI bill to pay for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't, that's not true. Um, there's, you know, it takes a lot to become a pilot. Um, so take your studies seriously so that you can progress through your school quickly and efficiently and, you know, as a better pilot. Um, and, um, once you get through that, your, your first job, you know, take that seriously, go through, um, you, whether it be a flight instructor or a tour job, um, is work you know, as make the sacrifices, you, you have to make sacrifices a little bit more difficult. If you have a family and kids and stuff, um, I was fortunate my first year working as a professional pilot and being paid, I worked between 75 to 90 hours a week for a straight year for, um, wow. one straight year. And I only earned $28,000 yeah. that year. Right. So, so uh, people, people might, people might think it's this highly paid glamorous thing right out the gate. No, no, definitely. And it, you, you know, just like a lot of, um, um, trades and stuff, um, you get told you, you have to put your time in, you have to, you know, Mm -hmm. um, do this in order to get to where you want to be. And it's true. I, I worked 75 to 90 hours a week for a straight year. Um, many times, um, flying up to my eight hour mark a day, because you can only fly eight hours in a day. Right. Um, that's that but sweat the, equity right there that you're yeah, putting but the, in. The, the, yeah, the faster you go through that, regardless of your pay. Now, obviously, it's it's a, it's a lot more difficult if you have children, um, mm-hmm. or you know, a family to support and, and be part of. Also, because um, I can tell you right now, working 14 hours a day or 17 hours a day, um, I did not have a social life that year. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so basically, do it while you're you're young if you can get it get yeah, that knocked I mean, out of the way quicker. Yeah, once you get to 
um, your dream job. Um, the faster you get through that, you'll get to your dream job. And, and I can tell you right now, I, I make a pretty good living. I mm-hmm. work um, seven days on, seven days off. Um, I can work more if I want to. But my bare minimum, I basically work six months out of the year. That's um, amazing. And, and make, you know. Decent money. Very well, decent money. Be- well, well, more beer, than... beer's on you next time I see you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, you know, where, where can our listeners connect with you uh, online um, yeah, if, if they want to follow up with you after the, the podcast? Yeah, if anybody you know listening has any questions about either my military or helicopter life, feel free to reach out to me on Instagram. That'd be the easiest way. It's my most public um, platform um, with the handle of F Crawford 8. That's F-C-R-A-W-F-O-R-D in the number 8. Um, That's phenomenal. Yeah, and um, if you don't mind, I'd like to, to close it out with a quote um, related sure. to pilots, if you don't mind. Let's um, do it. Yeah, so uh, Leonardo da Vinci once said that, you know, once um, you have tasted flight, you will forever walk with the earth, um, walk the earth with your eyes turned skyward for there you have been and there you will always long to return. Um, and that's what keeps me going. Always, uh, always ready to get back in the helicopter seat and ready to go fly again. That's beautiful. Thanks, man. I, I really appreciate it. And we'll, we'll have to have you back on sometime. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, thanks right. for having me. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. All right. Thank you for listening. That's the first episode of the Know It Some podcast. I'm your host, Steve Platt. Please, if you liked what you heard, like, subscribe, comment, rate us five stars, retweet it, share it, whatever you can do to grow our listener base. And we can continue to bring you wonderful, amazing guests like Forrest Crawford. I have several lined up. Would love for that list to grow. But I can't do that without having a good listener base. And so please, I'm I'm asking you, if you liked it, five stars and comment, rate, all that great stuff. Uh, See you next time on the Know It Some podcast.